Good morning. I'd like to uh, begin today by uh, rolling the calendar back to uh, the uh, spring of 1940. French military strategy was based on a massive defensive line uh, called the Maginot Line. It uh, took 10 years to build, was uh, over 500 miles long, and was equipped with the finest weapons available in the day. And the, uh, the, the French people and the French military were, uh, were, felt very safe and, and secure behind what they thought was the best defensive strategy that had ever been deployed in virtually military history. Unfortunately, they were wrong. It was a false sense of security based on outdated strategy, outdated intelligence, and outdated metrics. And while the French were looking backward at things that had helped them during World War I and past conflicts, the Germans were looking forward, developing the new military strategy built on speed and agility. In less than six weeks, the Germans overran the French army, which was one of the great armies of the time, almost losing World War II before it began because of bad strategy and bad and outdated metrics. The, uh, as I've, I've thought about the change that, that's occurring and the volatility that exists in our business, and uh, particularly with the emerging strategies in, uh, in uh, technology and automation that were uh, shown in great detail yesterday, and, I, and I'm still trying to digest some of the, the uh, comments that we just heard from Michael Lewis. The, uh, I, I fear that there are companies, well-established companies in transportation and logistics that are also comfortably sitting behind a false sense of security and their own marginal line. The reality, and it's a frightening one, moving forward, the pace of change and the pace at which data is being captured and, and, and analyzed now far exceeds the pace that we have traditionally learned and, and applied knowledge to our lives and to our organizations. Moving forward is going to require organizations to transform how they learn, and how they communicate to their people, their partners, and their customers. The, uh, and, and also how we, uh, how we manage and capture the data that's within our organizations and that that's outside. And then how we select our metrics and apply them. Metrics uh, are a critical source of guidance for how we, we manage, how we measure, and we communicate our, our, our uh, performance in, of our, our key uh, process metrics. And uh, I, I, I see the, uh, uh, the, the role of metrics also as being kind of an early warning system that helps us see when competitive threat or, or inefficiencies are creeping into our core processes but they've got to be actively managed. And too often I, I encounter leaders that are holding on to obsolete or static metrics or inwardly focused metrics that I often see in, in real operations that are simply outdated in, in creating uh, unnecessary exposure. The uh, metric selection, application, and, and even the structure are changing at a dramatic pace. And as leaders, it's very important that we facilitate and encourage that are the uh, engagement of our teams in, in making this process uh, uh, part of our everyday lives as we move forward. I'm very excited that we've got a great panel today uh, to help us explore this intriguing topic. So let me uh, introduce them at this time. First is Chris Henry. Here's Chris. Chris is the program manager of the TCA profitability program. He, uh, he also leads best practice groups and is responsible for the Engage benchmarking program. Chris is also involved in the uh, truckloadsindexes.com partnership that was described uh, with uh, Freightways yesterday in, in uh, the morning session. Our second uh, panelist is David Rush. He's the uh, president of KSM Transport Advisors. They're a leading edge uh, consulting firm that specializes in carrier profitability. David brings uh, over 25 years of direct experience in the industry, so he brings a really rich message to his clients as they, uh, 
they are finding new ways to uh, leverage uh, their data. And then finally, our third panelist is Scott Friesen from uh, Echo Global Logistics. He is the uh, Vice President of Strategic uh, of Analytics at, at ECHO and really is, is a key part of driving technology through their organization, which as those of you that know ECHO, that is it's core to their being and has really driven their phenomenal results over the last few years. So we've got a lot of ground to cover. Chris? Perfect. So just as a quick reminder, um, the TCA profitability program collects uh, primarily general ledger data uh, from our reporting carriers. So that can be uh, anywhere between uh, 30 and uh, 630 uh, data points each month uh, from our reporting carriers. And as you get into a best practice group, you're reporting more and more data. Um, what I wanted to do today uh, was talk uh, really briefly about uh, what we consider floodgate KPIs. So when a carrier is onboarded with us, uh, the three main KPIs that we, that we take a look at to see, first of all, is, is the data looking right? And then second of all, where they need to focus their attention on. So it all begins with uh, our uh, calculation of gross margin. So on the screen, I'm not gonna go through all, all the individual uh, line items there, but um, the two that a lot of the carriers in the room would exclude from the calculation would be maintenance and the equipment financing cost, so depreciation being the biggest expense. So the reason we include that in gross margin is because it allows us to compare against all operating modes. But if you were to participate in something that, that David is working on, he would typically exclude the depreciation. So that if you're in a, looking at your results compared to specific operating modes, you would exclude those. But um, that's the calculation for gross margin. And it ties into something that we call the golden uh, ratio. So ideally, we want customers on the first one, which is uh, admin overhead, to be 25% of your calculated gross margin. That's the target. And what you see on the screen is the results uh, from our TPP 20 index uh, through uh, Q3 2018. Um, so you can see, and ideally, you want to be trending lower. So you want to have a lower expense, and your admin overhead would be all your non-driving wages and benefits. So uh, obviously, since this is related to gross margin, as you, your gross margin is going up, uh, this should be uh, going down. But there's some other forces that are coming to play. There's a lot of uh, uh, carriers that are spending a lot of time um, looking at things like uh, robotic process, process uh, automation, um, looking at implementing tools that they never thought of, you know, prior to, you know, people hearing about freight waves and, and all these startups coming into the uh, trucking industry. So you're seeing that portion going down outside of uh, the gross margin calculation. Second one is, oh. perfect. <laughs> Sorry, this, this is mislabeled. The th this one is actually gross margin, the calculation itself. And then the second one is admin overhead. And then the final one is uh, what we consider uh, fixed overhead. So fixed overhead is basically outside of those variable costs that I went through and your non-driving wages and benefits. It's your rent, uh, your utilities, um, uh, your communication expense, your permitting expense. Uh, so this should also be uh, targeting around 25% percent of gross margin. So to distill the golden ratio in a really quick nutshell, you want to be at 25 percent gross margin. Your admin overhead as a percentage of gross margin should be 25 percent of that gross margin and then 25 percent reserve for fixed overhead. And what that equals um, for the carriers in the room is a 87 and a half percent operating ratio, which in a healthy market, all carriers should be able to um, achieve. So that's something that gets a lot of attention from both new carriers joining the program as well as uh, existing uh, carriers. Um, so in a nutshell, that's, that's uh, our floodgate KPIs, and then they can dive down deeper into one of 230 KPIs. So if, you're, if your gross margin calculation is not looking good, we can determine is it maintenance, uh, is it your driver wage, wages and benefits, it, uh, is it your depreciation costs, Typically right now, 
the, the issue is maintenance costs. You can't do much about driver wages and benefits. It's going up. The market, you have to play the market in that regard. But maintenance is a, can be a big black hole, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a couple seconds. Thanks, Chris. Uh, my name is David Rausch. I'm the president of KSM Transport Advisors. We're a consulting firm to the truckload industry located in Oklahoma City. We're affiliated with Catsapper Miller uh, in Indianapolis, which is a top 25 accounting firm. So our goal when we work with carriers is to help them make more money. Uh, and we do that in a number of ways, but the primary way we do that is by helping them understand their revenue model or their freight network. Uh, for an irregular route over the road truckload carrier, it's very difficult to understand what's profitable and not profitable unless you use some sort of math. So I'm going to show you a one minute film that distills hopefully four or five hours of information into uh, one minute. I guess that didn't work. Okay, I guess we're not going to see the movie. All right, um, so our goal when we help carriers with freight network engineering is to improve their profitability by maximizing this yield metric. And so we're going to talk about what yield is, but before we talk about what it is, let's talk about why it's important. So the reason that yield is important is that it's a doppelganger for operating ratio. There's a direct, albeit inverse, correlation between yield and operating ratio. As yield goes up, operating ratio goes down. Operating ratio for truckload carriers is profitability. Low is, low is um, good. So here's how you calculate yield. Um, Chris talked about margin, that's the beginning, so revenue minus cost. We use direct and variable costs, as, as Chris stated. Uh, that's margin. Uh, we divide that margin by time. Uh, time is the denominator. Uh, time is a, a, a depreciable commodity for trucking companies. You can never make up revenue. That's what I learned when I first started dispatching. You can't make up revenue tomorrow that you don't get today. The trucks can't drive faster, especially in today's environment. So revenue minus cost, the margin, margin divided by time is margin per day. We're actually changing that to uh, margin per hour. And then really importantly, yield, our magic metric, is how that margin per day fits into the carrier's freight network. So in over the road truckload trucking, uh, pricing is lane dependent, it's directional, it's based on supply and demand. You get a lot of money to go to Miami, you get nothing to come out of Miami. So for, for a carrier, here's two loads. You're in Columbus, Ohio. You have a load going to Newark, New Jersey that pays $4 a mile. You have another load going to Kansas City that pays $2.25 a mile. Which one's more profitable? Well, the answer is it, it really depends on the carrier's freight network uh, because all of this operates in, inside of their network. Um, the carrier that, that I pulled that example from uh, the yield was much higher going to Kansas City because of what happened to them after they got to Kansas City. The profitability on the freight after, after when they got to Kansas City overrode the difference between the $2.25 and the $4, $4 a mile. So what, is all, what does all this mean and what do you do with it? Um, well, we had a great setup today. Uh, one of our clients told us that what we do is Moneyball. Uh, I can't talk about it quite as well as the people up on the stage uh, earlier did, but what our clients tell us is that it gives them the strength of conviction to make the tough calls, to um, make things happen, to, um, uh, to make decisions, to get everybody on the same page. Uh, and, and finally, our clients like being called Brad Pitt. Uh, <laughs> we, we don't affiliate with Brad Pitt. Uh, we're these guys. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Dave. Uh, so, uh, again, my name is Scott Friesen. Uh, I run analytics at Echo. And uh, <clears throat> the assignment I was asked uh, for this, uh, you know, we sort of have like the, 
the prognosticators of past, present, and future metrics is, is how the assignment came down, and I was asked to do future. So um, apologies if this gets a little weird, but uh, I was given a 10-year horizon, so I went, I went out there a little bit. So three things that I think um, will be different in the coming decade. Um, my thanks to NASA for this imagery of a double black hole. I think that uh, we're going to measure in the future something that I'm calling anti-events. So right now, as you're probably aware, there's a lot of investment going on. We saw a lot of it yesterday that has to do with tracking visibility. Where is the freight now? Where is the truck now? What's happening? Tremendous amount of accountability about that. But if you follow that line of thought and ask, well, why do we want to actually know where that truck is? Why do we want to see that map? The, the real answer is we want to anticipate issues. And some of the folks that presented yesterday and other folks that I've seen are producing predictive scores. We're doing some work in that space as well to anticipate risks of shipments arriving on time. So then you ask yourself again, why do we want to know that? And the answer is we want to prevent downtime for our clients whether it's an inbound shipment of parts at a manufacturer, whether it's an outbound shipment to a customer that's critical, whatever those uh, sort of mission critical events are, much of this effort that's currently focused on, on where things are and the status of things is all in anticipation of being proactive instead of reactive and preventing outages and poor service. And so I believe that as we get better and better at that and, and having you know, visibility to where the freight is as well as predictive modeling to know whether or not it's going to be late is going to put the industry in a position, whether you're shipper, broker, carrier, or, or a partnership of, of the combination of those, uh, to actually prevent events from happening, which means that you're adding value in a way by keeping those things from happening, which is what I'm calling anti-events. Uh, and the reason why that becomes interesting and difficult to measure is it's very easy to take for granted uh, problems that don't happen and assume that there are no problems being prevented. But of course, that'll be an issue uh, if that does get taken for granted because those proactive efforts will, will fail. So uh, measuring this and communicating this across the supply chain, I believe, is going to become important. The second thing I want to talk about is uh, driver pay. Um, I, relative to many of you in the room and relative to my peers on the panel, am a relative novice to this industry. I'm about four years in to this industry, and I've been hearing about the driver shortage the entire time I've been involved. I find that conversation a little bit curious, honestly. Um, I, I understand and respect the challenges and difficulties of the job. Uh, I think it is a challenging job that definitely has some lifestyle drawbacks, but there's lots of jobs and lots of industries that have rough lifestyles. Uh, the coal miners have been fighting desperately to get to continue to mine coal, even though we know that it is shortening their lives every day they're down in the mine, but they're desperate to do it. Why? Because they make a good living doing it. And so I believe in the labor market, ultimately there is a set of wages that, uh, that uh, eliminates that gap. But the other issue I think is a slight convolution that goes on in terms of how the pay happens which is that it's all based on per mile. And as we can see with the ELDs, with detention and challenges of timelines, um, I would not be surprised if in the coming years there are measurements of, of driver pay that are viewed more hourly than by distance or some combination of distance and hourly. That's something, an evolution that I think uh, uh, there's a decent likelihood of happening in the coming years. And then the last thing is, um, uh, system dynamics. Um, we look at a lot of measurements right now and someone who's got a lot of experience looking at a dashboard of measurements is doing that in anticipation of the knock-on effects. And the academic study of this is called system dynamics and if you're not familiar with Jay Forrester's work I'd recommend um, looking him up uh, from MIT to understand how these, th these things happen. But you can think of it as uh, sort of a domino effect. One thing happens here and it causes a knock-on effect and that can actually accelerate. And many folks in operations live with that sort of thing. The one forklift driver calls in sick and so you get backed up and now that, that sort of creates a whole cascade of events that you spend a lot of time recovering from. What I have there is a little person with a little robot head <laughs> next to it. I believe that in the coming years, our ability to anticipate those kinds of knock-on effects and 
understand complex system interactions of measurements, both operational and financial, is going to dramatically improve. And so you're going to have decision making that's a combination of human and uh, computerized support. Um, you'll note I'm probably trying to avoid using AI since uh, it feels like it's the, it's the acronym of the day, but it is probably some sort of artificial intelligence uh, assistance. And in that collaboration, can do a better job uh, anticipating issues and uh, responding to the cascade of events, not just the event in the moment. So uh, that's, that's what I have to say about future metrics. You're making me worried with the, uh, the change that is occurring and, and the potential impact uh, that it'll have on our industry is both exciting and frightening. But David, I'm, in, I'm intrigued by the, the change that, that clearly is occurring with, with how your carriers are seeing the business that drives, business and customers that drive their profitability. Um, it's very valuable, but do you see them kind of translating that or incorporating that into how they communicate with customers? Uh, yeah, Brian, that's a great question. Thank you. So our, our clients definitely use the information. You know, knowledge is power, the old, the old saying. And, and if you really believe in the numbers and, and all the data points that, that go into making the numbers that the carriers are, are provided, they're able to have really quality discussions with their shippers about what freight is good for them and about what freight is not, and, and more importantly, why. And, and they also have the strength of conviction to give freight back if it doesn't work for them. Uh, conversely, and this is probably goes against what a lot of people in the audience might think, but it also gives them the opportunity to trade by knowing what is really profitable and being able to reduce price on that uh, in order to get concessions on other freight, uh, which will increase their overall margin, or to um, uh, get more volume on that specific business that is so profitable that if they get more, more volume, they're going to generate more total margin. Excellent. Thank you. I think one takeaway I have is if, if I'm a sh either a carrier or I'm a customer and I'm not having that type of conversation, I think it, it's time to uh, reassess where you are at or where your carrier's at. But uh, I think that's a, 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 a kind of a, a good aha moment. Uh, Chris, you've been doing some pretty amazing uh, work helping your carriers uh, understand all the, the moving pieces that, that drive their profitability. Are, for the carriers that perhaps are new to the process or, or um, just in the early stages, are there any uh, takeaways that you found that there are either certain cost areas or individual variable costs that have really had a profound uh, impact over others? Well, going back to gross margin, obviously the first thing is asking for more money. Um, that's the easy one. Uh, so using something like David has to have the data to back up those conversations. The other thing is collecting within there, collecting properly and efficiently on accessorial revenue. So uh, having the data to uh, show that you did in fact, your drivers did in fact uh, wait around for six hours at a location is, is key. And uh, having a, uh, an ability to collect on that information or collect on that revenue is, is uh, a priority. Um, within the cost, the variable cost, maintenance is probably the biggest, as I mentioned, black hole. So looking at parts inventory management is a big discussion within the groups. Um, I always say if, if you're looking, and this is from education from the carriers, if you're looking at buying a uh, trucking company, instead of looking at their financial statements, go and take a look at how clean and organized their facilities are, their shop facilities are. So that will tell you a lot about their culture and also a lot about how they manage their costs. So, Maintenance would be one, and then also non-driving wages and benefits, automating processes, uh, you know, making sure that you have the right people in place to uh, keep things moving in the right direction. Thank you. Scott, the, the concept of layered metrics and the complexity that you describe is potentially out in front of us uh, is intriguing, but I would think is a foreign topic to many folks here as, as it is to me, um, what should people be thinking about doing or potentially investing in to prepare their organizations and, and their team for, for that uh, 
that future? The first thing I'd say in terms of preparing for that is um, you can't do analysis on data you don't have. So if you're not collecting your parts inventory or your parts inventory usage or your critical failures for your power units, if you're not collecting that information, then you're not going to be able to go back and draw conclusions between your maintenance procedures and your outages. So the first thing is if you're not collecting the data, start. If you don't have a fancy system, Google Sheets, Excel, you know, start by collecting the information. That's, that, that should begin tomorrow. Um, and then the second thing is, is the mindset. You know, I do think that a lot of folks look at teams like mine or roles like mine and they think that we're, we're doing something deeply and fundamentally different and I don't really think of it that way. I actually think that we are codifying what some of the most seasoned professionals in the industry have been doing intuitively. So when I talk about developing an algorithm to do truck pricing, you can go to any experienced broker on the floor and ask them how they decide on the price of the truck and they'll start listing a rule, a set of sort of rules of thumb that they have in mind. Well, what they call rules of thumb in their mind, we would call an algorithm, right? And so it's, it's not actually so far away. And, and an example of the combining the anti-event sort of concept with the system dynamic concept and putting it squarely in what Chris is describing is imagine that you could know that certain maintenance activities reduce the probability of a critical outage by a certain percentage. And now imagine that you apply the dollars that would be lost both in the moment as well as the future reputation problem that it produces for not delivering for that customer. And now you can generate essentially a probabilistic view of those dollars and compare that against the maintenance improvements that you're going to make in your business. And so now you actually have a very rational decision of dollars against dollars that you're, you're, you don't want to roll the dice you know, on, on pushing your maintenance out. Um, and I, again, I think, that, I think that some of the experienced, sophisticated folks in the industry think in some of these ways already, but it's not necessarily codified. And if it's not codified, then it can't be scaled, which means that the, the one owner that's been in the business forever, that, that person might be able to do it, but he or she can't get you know, teams of people to all be on the same page when it's all in their head. Does that make sense? It does. Good. The, uh, you know, when, when I, I think about the commentary that Michael Lewis shared about the, the transformation in baseball and in some of the other industries he's, he's interacted with, and then the conversation has migrated into the trucking space, um, I, I, I really believe we are, uh, we're on the kind of the leading edge of a, a, a real breakthrough on how our industry functions. Uh, and, and metrics are clearly a big part of that. And uh, the whole um, uh, access to data that f is, is kind of bringing old metrics back, uh, to, you know, back to life and, and creating new ones is something that uh, we just simply cannot ignore. And uh, in, in industries uh, like the trucking and the rail world that aren't always uh, first movers in, in the world of change and technology. I think that's something that we really have to change. And uh, uh, I think the time to do that is now. So uh, I, I wish you well, and I, I hope our discussion today has is, is planted a few questions and, and, and will motivate you to go back and, and have new conversations with your team, with your customers, and, and with your carriers. Thank you, panel, for a, a great discussion. Thanks.